Okay, let's start up in 10 seconds. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a good break. So I know we're in the middle of crunch time, and I'm going to do what's expected and give you one more homework assignment today. I'll try to walk you through that a little bit, and it'll help to clarify some of these comparisons that we're making. I'm not going to demo all of it for you in class, but I'll try to walk you through everything. I'll tell you a little bit of math today, but on your homework, you're going to work out the math for everything. So we're going to be covering these basic techniques, rich regression, Lasso, we've already talked about these, at least in their kind of naive setup. I'd say their deterministic setup is an optimization problem. We've already looked at the Bayesian correspondence to this. I'll go through that in a second. There is a way to formulate the Bayesian lasso in terms of an algorithm. This is one of my favorite papers that's out there. So lasso in general, At least this is probably the way that it was concocted originally. Is this right here? We're doing this optimization uh, where you've got this L2 term. These are squared pairs right here. Everything's getting producted into each other. And then it's got some penalty right here. And the rich formulation is very, very simple, or I should say very similar, but the answer is simple right here. So the solution right here, we already know for the rich solution. Does anybody remember this off the top of their head? X transpose So it looks very much like the least square solution. So just optimizing this right here gives you that solution. We always write at the top of all my classroom boards. And this is the rich solution. And you can figure this out just by working through a derivative, setting all the partial derivatives to zero, and solving for beta's. You might want to try that out. What we have done in class, and if you didn't see this, you can go back and review the lecture online, is we worked out the likelihood formulation. So this was part of the likelihood model, and this would be part of the prior right here. And so the implication here for the rich solution, if you're doing the Bayesian thing, you write down a likelihood function, and then you use a Gaussian prior. So I'll just make a note. Note. This is equivalent to using a Gaussian prior. on the betas. So that just looks like this. So pi beta, where my betas are going to be my vector of p betas in the regression model. This would just look like this right here. So I'll just write it down. Is this is going to be e to the minus 1 half beta transpose beta. So they're centered at 0 is where we're putting that in. I won't subtract off the 0. And then I have some scaling factor. And I'm going to write down that scaling factor arbitrarily. Don't get that confused with this right here. They're a little bit different. Uh, maybe I'll just come up with something else. I'll just write down a gamma right here. So this would be gamma squared if you want to think about that as your variance. So you're using a prior that looks like that. You would have the 1 over square root 2 pi. And then you'd have the gamma squares in here. And I would square root over the top, and I'd raise this to the p power. So that's the joint prior. You wouldn't need this part if you're going to work out what the optimal betas are. But basically, this term right here, the beta transpose beta, this thing right here, is just the sum of the beta j's squared, where j is going from 1 to p. And so that's acting as this part of the penalty in the exponent. So that's what we did when we were able to work out a solution where this regularizing parameter right here is a little bit different than gamma, but there's a one-to-one -one relationship between them. And so again, if you need a refresher, YouTube. So that lecture is from last time where we worked out the, the Bayesian equivalence. Um, this solution is a lot harder to get, simply because you can't do calculus because this has sharp edges right here. So this is plain putting a lot of sharpness at zero on everything. 
where this penalty looks like a circle, and it's kind of round and smooth at zeros at the intersections of everything, but this is more like a um, square shape, actually a diamond, where you're putting sharp edges at the zeros, and that induces zeros in the optimal solution. And so if you're trying to do model selection and figure out which one of the x's are important for explaining the y's in a regression model, um, it's equivalent to saying beta j is equal to zero if that covariate is not important. And so some people like this solution because it actually induces hard zeros. Computationally, it's a lot harder to get and you'll need an algorithm to do it. I'll show you one such algorithm in a moment, but for the homework that's upcoming, I don't care if you use software. So pre canned software to come up with your solutions. And I'll show you at least one example today. And then there's the thing that is my favorite thing to do, at least in spirit, but there's a computational price that you'll be paying and you'll be playing around with this on your upcoming homework, where you'll be using point mass mixture priors to end up placing mass at zero. So this is the delta function where beta j is equal to zero. We're gonna place some amount of mass there. So that's our prior mass on whether or not beta j is zero. These are usually pretty easy to come up with, so you might think that happen. or something like that. What you'll notice when you do this, this has all the influence. So that's measuring the distance from zero that you would need to be, before you rejected that beta j was zero. So all that stuff we did in hypothesis testing lends itself to model selection. And we can use this in a big algorithm to figure out which betas are, are zeros. And the thing I like about this is it ends up considering the joint relationship between all the betas. The betas that are not zeros, what their relationships are with each other, and what the zeros, what their relationship is with other variables in the model that are also zero. And it'll take me at least a lecture or two to walk you through the whole algorithm, but I'll be asking you to code this up. So we do a final MCMC project comparing all these different model selection techniques. Now, everybody wants to know what's the best model selection technique? And the answer is we don't know. Nobody really knows. It depends. So if you're dealing with problems where you have a lot of X's, i.e. a lot of betas, and all of them tend to be active, all of them help to explain why's, then probably you only have a few zeros in your system. But if all of a sudden you're just pouring junk into the model and using this setup as a filtering technique and just throwing away junk, you're probably starting with a lot of stuff and there's probably a lot of zeros. And so all of these techniques penalize differently. So in how it's penalizing it. So what we're really arguing over is whether or not our solution is sparse in the covariance that we have, or is it dense? And if we have a regularizer that pushes really hard, will it use more zeros? And so it depends on the problem. And so we'll never end this debate just by theorizing about it. All we can really do is see how it works in practice, and then figure out how to tune everything. So this is your regularization parameter in both of these models, but they're penalizing using different functions. And ultimately, this is your regularizing parameter in the point mass mixture primer set. So there was a cool paper that was written. This is one of my favorite papers to read through. I have implemented this once upon a time. And like most papers, I would say their results are optimistic. So this is Trevor Park and George Casella. This is the same Casella that writes the several textbooks. So this must be a good paper. But this is kind of a Bayesian formulation, and I'll encourage you to read through it. This is on the web page. And basically, they say, okay, here's your regression model. They were kind enough to separate out the intercept from all of the covariates. But I always put that intercept in as beta 1. So I usually encode in the X matrix a column of 1s. Um, and here's the, the lasso thing that you're doing, the same way we wrote it down. And there's a different way that you can kind of write everything out. So there's a hierarchical approach. As you kind of remember, when we were sampling and we were trying to infer in a Cauchy regression model, we didn't write down a Cauchy likelihood. Instead, we wrote down the normal thing with the mixture with a gamma. And that made a Cauchy. Does anybody know the reason we didn't just write down a Cauchy likelihood? Why did we use that scale mixture formulation? 
So gamma mixture with the normal is a T. Why do we do that? Anybody ever figure this out? So in the, the Gibbs sampler, you needed to infer, if you had 100 data points, you needed to infer 100 different parameters, the different gammas. So each data point, each residual, um, was associated with a different random variable gamma, and you'd have to infer that in your Gibbs sample. Of course, all that could be done in parallel. So you could speed up your code and make it fast, but it seems like maybe unnecessary computation. Why not just write down a Cauchy likelihood or a T likelihood? This is the first time you guys are thinking about that? So why? Megan wants to know. <laughs> She's finally tell me. Because the likelihood for a Cauchy if you had 100 data points, it would be a product of 100 things, different functions. If you had 1,000 data points, your likelihood evaluation would be the product of 1,000 things. And so that numerically would be very hard to handle. You can't logarithm your way out of that very easily either. You're still gonna have to do all of that computation. So this is a way of reformatting the same problem but being able to do something computationally a little bit nicer, that you don't have this big product that's gonna explode on you. And so hopefully that makes some sense. There is a, a mixture formulation of a double exponential or a Laplace prior. So this right here is using the double exponential or Laplace prior. We talked about that last time. And this is what that distribution looks like. So it looks like an exponential, but the random variable, the variable in this case is Z, has an absolute value on it. And so it looks like an exponential at zero and the exponential on the other side. The picture that we drew last time. So that's this distribution. I didn't put the normalizing constant out in front, but it looks just like the normalizing constant for an exponential, but because we've doubled the space we're operating on, we have to divide by two. So there's a different formulation right here. So this is a normal right here. So hopefully this is starting to make some sense. And this is a scale mixture over it, where I'm mixing over an exponential distribution. So this is an exponential distribution right here in terms of S. So I'm mixing an exponential with a normal. And magical things happen. It turns it into a double exponential. That's kind of nice. So this mixture approach sets up a Gibbs sample for you, where you can try to infer these mixture components just like we did with inducing a T distribution or a Cauchy distribution for a normal mixture with a gamma. So it's similar, but it's different. And so, and they end up walking you through and showing you how to implement this Gibbs sampler. And this is the Gibbs sampler that you would end up implementing. And so they tell you about all these different steps. So this is the full conditional distributions that they're writing down. The full conditionals for Y, the likelihood model, and the full conditional for beta, so that you're gonna be inferring in your Gibbs sampler so on and so forth, and then you've got this exponential thing that's going on. And they tell you how to concoct this, and I have coded it up before. One of the major questions that we always have is, what is the regularizing parameter? How do we pick it? And quite often, you'll do something called cross-validation. I think all of us know what cross-validation is, where we take a subset of our data, we fit the model on it, and then we see how well that solution fits our holdout set. And we do this over and over and over again. And then we twiddle around with this until our predictions on our holdout set get really good. Um, that's very computationally expensive. So every time you do a cross-validated iteration, you have to refit a model, which could take a long time, especially if this is hard to do. Then I need to compare to my um, holdout set and do it over and over and over again and then change lambda to repeat that process over and over again. Of course, it can be paralyzed as well, but that can be an expensive process. Those of you that know what the EM algorithm is um, will understand this part of the paper that there's an EM step that you can use to try to optimize what lambda is. And that's what this paper is all about, is setting up a GIF sampling technique for solving this problem and simultaneously tuning the regularizing parameter. And they tell you how it works. And so, and you can write through all this. So the hyperparameters for the lasso parameter, they talk about it right here. And then they talk about this EM 
empirical Bayesian step. And I'll tell you what empirical Bayes is in the last day or so of class, just so that you have an overview of what these are. You don't have to do anything with this paper other than just read it and appreciate it. What they say is this empirical Bayesian step, basically they're going to be refitting lambda using this formula. So at least in terms of understanding this formulaically, you could code this up. And so for every step of your Gibbs sampler, you could update lambda using this equation. And they get this out of a, um, a Bayesian optimization step. And I'll, I'll cover what it is later on. Uh, they say that this compares really well to cross-validating your solution so that you don't have to cross-validate and you simultaneously learn the, the regularization parameter. What I found is that in some simple cases, yeah, they're pretty comparable, but in most cases I work with, they're quite a bit different. So uh, this at least puts you in the ballpark, though, I would say. So I kind of like using this right here, and then after I know kind of around about where a good lambda is, then I might go through the cross-validation. So in reality, what I usually do is I usually run the optimizers for this that people have worked through. And it um, has to do with the partial least squares algorithm that we won't be covering. And um, there's a fast solution to it, and I'll usually seed my Gibbs samplers with the solution that I get out of a cross-validated solution. So lots of ways to try to fit these models and try to figure out where are the zeros and where are the non-zeros. You'll be experiencing this on your homework. So read through this, but I won't test you on it. So if you want to just hold this in reserve, that's okay too. But it's a, it's a pretty interesting paper. It's a fun paper to read through. Let me just um, have a look at the homework that's going to be coming out. I know I've got homework six here and homework five. Um, I've reduced one of your homeworks by one and kind of did a combination of homeworks throughout the semester. So that's why there's that. I didn't notice that until just right now. But this is going to be your final homework. It's going to be due December 15th by midnight. So you'll just be sending me, here's my homework, and if you have any extra credit that you want me to consider, like the um, pros, cons, or the take-home points from that p-value discussion, you can send that over by midnight on the 15th. I have to do all my grading on Thursday, so please get that. If you do miss it by five minutes, I'm going to be asleep, so I'm not even going to do this. So just get it to me by Wednesday night, and then I can get my grade. Um, here's your final homework. So don't let the Fs confuse you. I just put them in for completeness. I'm not going to use any fancy functions when I generate the data. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of Xs. And some of them I'm going to build my regressions off of. Now, um, there's all kinds of functional evaluations and things you can do with the Xs. Like I could square them. I could put them into the model, just into the model, or I could square them, or I could come up with interaction terms. And that's what my FJs are supposed to represent, all the different things I could do with the Xs. I will not be doing anything other than possibly a um, two-way interaction. So I might just have an interaction, no three-way interactions in my models. So I'm going to give you three different data sets where I did different things. So one of the data sets is going to be, it's going to give you a lot of n and small p. So p might be 10, and um, n might be 1,000. And my x's will probably be pretty orthogonal to each other. They'll be independent of each other, nothing funny. And you'll probably be able to all agree on what model I use to generate everything. I won't have any interactions in there. Um, but encoding your x's is something that we're supposed to do. We don't just throw them into a matrix. We think about what x's there could be. But ultimately, there's infinite number of possibilities that you could use to build your models. We want to start with stuff that makes sense. I'm going to give you three different models. So I'm going to give you one that's really easy to fit. And you guys can all agree. And probably by the third one, you guys will probably all disagree, depending on how you tune everything and what you're trying to explain which technique you used, how you picked size squared, did you standardize your data, did you rip out anything that's multi-collinear, so I might even be a little bit devious where I throw in a variable that's collinear. And if you try to fit your model with that, it's going to mess things up. I'll tell you, at least when you come down to do your Gibbs sampler down here using this, what will happen in terms of the model selection, well, the Bayesian will be able to fit their model if you had two variables explaining exactly the same thing, i.e. they are collinear with each other, they're a linear combination of each other, 
Because you might be throwing one out of the model and keeping one in, and then on the next iteration, you remove something from the model and you throw the other one in. And so they're um, negatively correlated with each other at the same time. And so you wouldn't want that because it would have a hard time converging. So you'll still need to do all that preliminary stuff that you normally do in the regression class. So again, I'm going to be formulating things out of models like this. My x's will only be up to two-way interactions. So, and I didn't put any polynomial terms in there or anything like that. So if I did put polynomial terms in, the model classes you'd have to search through are pretty large. But in reality, that is true. Okay, so I want you to compare a couple different techniques. So, the lasso, you could do ridge in here if you wanted to. I want you to do the thing using the point mass prior, that's the stochastic search variable selection algorithm, and I'll be walking you through that algorithm on Wednesday. Um, there's two other techniques that I haven't spent any time talking about. That's the Bayesian information criterion and the chi k information criterion. So BIC and AIC for short. There's a DIC out there if you know anything about it, but these are different model selection techniques. Does anybody know what deviance means? I left it in there so you can look it up. What's deviance? Between two models. So it's a thing you use to compare models. So what do they teach you in GLM class, or if you guys not have that class? It's the difference in the model I think between the data given the data and yeah, so deviance. Steven said it's the difference in the logs. So I might have a log. We use the natural log. So this is going to be uh, um, your likelihood. And it's going to be conditional on x's and y's. And I'm going to say these are the betas for model one. So I might have some number of betas in there. Maybe it's the full model where I put all p betas in there. Or maybe it's a reduced model right here. So maybe this is something like beta 1 is some value. This one I'm going to hold to be 0. So I'm going to kick out beta 2, beta 3, and beta 4 is in the model. And then maybe I compare that to the logarithm. Uh, some other model. So this is going to be beta, it's all called model 1, let me just say m1, em2, given the same x's and the same y's. So maybe model 2 is this model right here, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, and beta 4. And none of them are zeros. So this would be the comparison between a model where we've left out the second covariant and the full model. And you can compare any models against each other. I could compare beta 1 being 0, this being 0, against this whole thing. And so there's a lot of possibilities for comparisons. How many different comparisons can you make? A lot. It's to the p. That second log is the light log of light right now. Yeah, that's right. So it's the difference between these two things right here. So this is deviance right here. Now, what most people will do just out of convention, we have to watch our signs, is they'll take the difference between these two things. You'll recognize this is really the log likelihood ratio. So that's the difference. Now, I usually throw a minus 2 right in front of it. That minus two has everything to do with the minus one half sitting out in front of all of your terms in the exponent of a, a normal distribution. So it's canceling those. So that's what deviance is. So it's log likelihood ratio comparison. And then there's some penalty. And so this is starting to feel very Bayesian that it's like log likelihood plus some penalty. And the penalties come in different flavors. So the BIC penalty is going to be log n, where n is the number of data points that you have. And delta p is the difference in the number of parameters that are in the model. So for this comparison right here, I have four parameters in the model. In this comparison, I have three parameters in the model. 
because this one is being held at zero, and so delta P would be one. There's a one parameter difference in those columns. That's what delta P is. Wikipedia has this all explained, or any um, generalized linear modeling that will go through all of this. So it's basically a log likelihood comparison between things. If you're going to use BIC or AIC to compare models, you have to run through every comparison out there. So how many different models are there? There's two to the P different models. And so you need to come up with some algorithm of which models do you want to compare to each other. So I'd probably start out with a full model and then start reducing one of the variables and pulling one of the variables out. And then if it seems like, hey, that's a better fit, then I might pull out another parameter thing. So that's called backward selection when you do that. If you started with the reduced model, you'd start with no parameters in the model, and then you'd use maybe this um, criterion to figure out which variable you want to add to the model first. That's called forward selection. And if you go back and forth, that's called stepwise selection. So all those things that you may have learned in a regression class. So stepwise selection usually has BIC and AIC and something like MATLAB or R already built into it. You can use all of that code, but I'll let you do the research. Um, this is a little bit different, AIC. The only difference between BIC and AIC is the asymptotic properties right here. Um, it has delta P being the same penalty, but instead of using log N, it uses two. And you might wonder where these things come from. So BIC is an asymptotic approximation for working through the full-blown Bayes factor and figuring out which Bayes factor, you know, you use that for your selection, but you don't have to do any integrations. So you don't have to solve all those Bayes factors. If you use a normal prior, where the variance is one. And it's the Laplace approximation for that. And if you know what that is, that's cool. And if you don't, that's just something for your future. This is how this is derived. And this has a completely different non-Bayesian um, derivation. Usually, this is at least explained asymptotically to work well in cross-validated cases. I usually like this because it penalizes harder. So I usually, if I'm trying to look for sparse solutions, I'd like to penalize a little bit harder. Um, and we'll talk about the SSVS solution on Wednesday. I'll try to give you a prelude to it, maybe at the end of this class. Let me show you how um, Lasso works. Oh, also for this, I think what I say is, what you're gonna do is for this data set right here, and I'll show you where it is in a second, you're gonna compare some model selection techniques. If you'd like to use Ridge, or some other technique, throw it in. So, and you can replace one of these. The only one you can't replace is SSVS. I'd like you to compare using that. This is a good exercise to get that Gibbs sample code in. So, you're going to repeat this exercise on different data sets of varying complexity. So, data set one is the hard, is the easiest one, data set two is the medium one, and data set three is the hardest one. Those you can all find here. So here are all your different data sets. You can click on that, and there it is. And I think I've explained what it is. Column one is the Ys, and Xs are the covariants, and those are all your other columns. So you'll just download that as a text file, read it in, and you'll be underway. So even data set one is fairly large, but P is small and N is very huge. So it should be easy for you to figure everything out. These other, um, problems are a little bit bigger. So P is bigger and N is smaller, but I didn't make them so big that you can't read them in the way. They're relatively small, with varying degrees of difference. Let me show you how the lasso works. So again, I don't want you to code up the big um, Bayesian lasso thing. You can use an optimizer just like this. So let me walk you through this example. Can everybody see it? Or do I need to increase bond size? That's me. Okay, let's just look at what I've got here. I've generated some X's from a normal distribution. Um, so I ended up coming up with a hundred by five. So there's five X's for each Y, and then I have a hundred observations of that. And this is what this does. And they're all independently constructed. 
So I don't need to do any Gram-Schmidt or orthogonalization or anything like that that I do in a regression class because I've generated everything in the So I'm going to apply some weights. My weights are my betas. So you'll notice that I have three zeros in there. So effectively, when I generate my regression using this, x times my weights, those are my betas, I only have two active coefficients. And I'd like to figure that out. I'd like to figure out which ones are zeros. So can I add in a little bit of random error? Right here. And so I would encourage you when you're working through your different solutions to build some generators. Don't just use my data that I've given you. Generate data from answers that you know with the truth is, so that you can see how well it's working. So otherwise, you're going to give me something where it's just, I'm just going to see the errors. There's got the errors in this code because you've given me a ridiculous answer. So anytime I give somebody a real answer for a real data set, I built a simulator and I think it's, it's a pretty simple simulator. So this is how the, the lasso works in MATLAB. So there's a piece of code called lasso, and it has a couple different inputs. And if I wanted to know all about lasso, I could end up typing in help lasso. And it'll tell me all about it. It'll tell me about all these different inputs, so on and so forth, and tell, tell me what it gives back, and you can read. And R has something simple built into it. Um, I can tell the procedure how to fit everything and how to pick lambda. And what I've invoked is cross-validation, where this is going to be a leave 10 out cross-validation. So from my 100 data points, I'm going to fit models on 90 data points picked at random. And then I'm going to cross-validate and see how well that model explains the other 10 holdout. Data points. And I'm going to do that over and over again, and I'm going to try to minimize a criterion like this, figure out which one is closest. So I'll try to minimize basically this thing right here, the MSE in the model. So that's the mean square there. Um, I can give predictor names if I want to, so that I can have nice namings and not come up with whatever that lab assigns to it. So. Punching your X's, punching your Y's, tell it how you want it to do the fit, and there's some options. And then there's some plots, and it tells me basically how different lambdas work. So what it's going to do is it's going to do this really intensive scheme where it's going to pick a lambda, and then it's going to run a big tenfold cross-validation, and it's going to do it a zillion times. And then it's going to pick a different lambda, and it's going to do the same thing, and then it's going to show me how all the different model fits look. And there's a plot that I can look at. And then there's some things that I can look at as well. Um, these are the indices on lambda. So what lasso gives you back is it gives you back betas. And these are going to be the betas for each corresponding lambda. We'll look at those in a second. And then it's going to give me this big data structure that I have access to different elements that are uh, alluded to in the help file. And so I can end up looking at the index for the lambda that minimizes MSE. This is very well named in the data stru structure, index min MSE. I go back to my help right here. I can look at all this stuff. And I can look at index min MSE. This is the index of the lambda with the value that minimizes the MSE. So that, in some sense, is your best lambda. It gives you the best fit. So lots to chew through, and I'll have this code up for you if you want to see it. But this is almost directly out of the help file. And then I can tell you the betas that correspond to that lambda. So let's run it, see what we come up with. So the first part of your homework, fit lasso, is about this easy. So not too much work. And rich is even easier, because you have an analytical solution. So this will be... Boom. It did all that cross-validation. So 
probably multi-threaded something, did a whole bunch of things basically in parallel. And so, but it's pretty cool. So I say that it's a big computational burden, but if you have efficient code, you usually do things fast. Keep in mind, this is a tiny problem. 100 by five. So I can look at this thing right here. I don't usually look at this, but I like to demonstrate it in class. Is this is my lasso plot. It knows how to construct this from the code. I didn't do anything fancy other than call the plot. And it tells me the MSE for various lambda values. So here's my lambdas. So as I end up making them bigger and bigger and bigger, this is actually bigger going this way. This is one over 10 over here. And this is one. And these are numbers that are much bigger than one. So this is just cranking this number and making it bigger and bigger and bigger. As you make that number bigger and bigger and bigger, it enforces this penalty right here. So if the betas are big, then it gets penalized harder. And so if I make this infinite, it's gonna shut everything out of the model. Say, you don't want betas to be big at all. I don't really care about this term. There's some sort of a balancing act here. And so the question is, is which lambda do you pick? And ended up saying, pick one of these ones way over here that are small. What I usually recommend to people is a, it's kind of a careful balance of how parsimonious do you want your model. But you probably don't want a lambda over here, but you probably want something over in this range. Sometimes people will ask you to pick something in the hook of this, or they'll pick their optimal one and they'll look one standard deviation out. And that's what it gives you. So what it actually is giving you in all of this so I'm gonna give you two other things. This is the fit info MSE, so that's the y-axis on the plot, and these are the lambdas corresponding to that. So instead of looking at the plot, these are the same things right here. So as my lambdas end up getting bigger, my errors end up getting bigger as well. The model doesn't fit as well. So it's this balancing act between how parsimonious do you want your model and how much variance do you want to explain your model. Um, the betas themselves look like this. These are betas associated with each one of the lambdas that it considered in the solution. And so there's varying degrees of zeros right in here. If we look at these solutions, they're all pretty similar to each other. They're a little bit different. So if you remember how I generated the data, I had a two in the second position and I had a minus three in the fourth position. And this is doing pretty good. So and it shoved all those other things out to be zeros. If I fit the rich solution, these would be close to zeros, but they wouldn't be exact zeros. That's why people like the last one. And so, and then I can pick maybe some optimal um, beta. So this is gonna be the beta associated with whatever this optimal lambda is. And it's done all this bidding for me. So this is intended to be relatively simple, but it'll give you some experience operating with this code. So maybe that's my optimal solution. Of course, if I'm a statistician, I'm going to take this, I'm going to throw away these three X's right here, and I'm going to go back and refit my model to come up with the posterior using these two X's. So there'll be two betas, and I'll quantify its uncertainty, and I'll give you intervals off of that. So as a Bayesian compromise, I might run this lasso optimizer, and then I'll go back and I'll just say, get rid of all the other X's, throw it into my Bayesian posterior model, you know, maybe flat prior on the betas, because it's a shift parameter essentially, and just tell you what the, the um, Bayesian solution is. The mean of it would be that X transpose X inverse X transpose. So you'll play around with this. There's not exactly right answers, but there's different degrees of good answers. And you'll try to explain this in your own work. Any questions about that? Okay, let's take a minute to just look at SSVS. And so how we use a point mass prior to do model selection. So I wanna walk you through this phase factor just real quickly because this is gonna be the quintessential part to understanding the MCMC algorithm. 
and you'll be coding up and I'll walk you through what that algorithm is supposed to look like so you'll know what to do. to the p minus 1 different ways you can compare all those models. So lots of combinations. You don't need to compare every model to every model. So um, let's say we have model 1 is the full model. So this is going to be beta 1 to beta p non-zeros. Model 2 is going to look like this. It's going to be beta j is equal to 0. Everything else is not 0 Basically, I can take this setup and compare every model to every model doing this. So if I ended up having beta j being equal to zero, and I wanted to know if there's some beta j prime being equal to zero, then I'd take my model with beta j being zero, I'd call that the full model, and I would compare it to this other more reduced model. So you can extrapolate this idea to make all your model comparisons. What I want you to do is work through the Bayes factor for this. So I think that's part of the homework. My first question is, work through the Bayes factor and do the math. It's basically a completion of the square exercise. I'm going to tell you what the solution is. And then you'll just show me that you know how to work through that. I think next week on Wednesday, after our last day, I can do a review session. So if you guys are needing some help, I'll be here for a review. Um, so I want to come, come up with a base factor. For comparing model one to model two. I'm going to say, I'm going to switch this. Model two to model one. I'm going to put this one right here into the numerator. And this one is going to be the thing in the denominator. If you want the base factor for the other comparison, it's just the inverse. And so what does this base factor look like? And let me give you a little bit of notation first. So x minus j is going to be equal to all the whole x matrix. This is this whole matrix. But then I'm going to take the j column and I'm going to make this zeros. Instead of doing that, I'm just going to cancel it out altogether. So I'm going to remove it. So that would be equivalent to having that column being there with all zeros in there, or the beta j being introduced in front of it. Everything would be multiplied by zero. So this is just going to remove the j column. Y j, y minus j is going to be y1. And I'm going to end up taking out the, well, this one actually will be the same. I don't actually need that. So beta j, beta minus j, will be equal to beta 1 down to beta j minus 1, beta j plus 1, down to beta p. So 
So I'm just going to remove that element. So just a little bit of notation. So the phase factor, and I don't have to write everything out that way, but it's going to look like this. So I'm going to compare model two to the full model. Let's just work out what the denominator looks like. I want you to keep in mind this is the prior that we're using for the betas themselves. So this is going to look like this. Hit it roll. And I'm going to put in my likelihood model. You know what that looks like, the Gaussian thing. Make sure you have all your normalizing constants in the numerator and the denominator are the same. We'll have a likelihood function. I could write this down in more detail next time. And this one is going to be my prior on all of my data, but I'm going to be a little bit specific about this. This is going to be 1 over root 2 pi, and then there's going to be this psi squared hanging out right in there. So psi squared is the regularization parameter in the prior. This will be raised to the p prior power. This actually is important. You can't exactly drop this thing. And you'll see why in a minute. Give myself a little bit more room. This is going to be e to the minus one half beta transpose beta. And this is going to be over psi squared. D beta. So my D beta right here, this is actually beta one of beta p. So you're doing this multi-dimensional thing. How do you do this? This function will be Gaussian. This is Gaussian. How do you figure this thing out? Hopefully you remember the trick I taught you once upon a time. So, or you work through by scratch and you complete the square and you figure out what this integral is. So that's that same integral you've been mucking around with all semester. Should that be P minus one if you remove the J? I didn't do that yet. So then, oh, it did, sorry, this is not the full model, right? You are absolutely correct. So let's just leave that for a second. This I meant to put down here. 2 pi, psi squared. This is square root over the top, so I've messed this whole thing up. So this is raised to the p, but Stephen's got it right. So e to the minus 1 half beta transpose beta over psi squared. d beta. So this is a p-dimensional integral. This is going to be something similar right here. So this is going to be, just like Steven said, there's only p minus 1 non-zero betas in here. So this is going to be 2 pi psi squared to the p minus 1. Super important. Square root over the top. e to the minus 1 half beta minus j transpose beta minus j. So I'm going to remove all of those right here. It's going to be divided by psi squared. And then there's this other one. Beta j is equal to zero right here. So it's just as a reminder. And I'm going to integrate over the whole beta space. I could integrate over just the p minus 1 betas, but I'm just going to put this in so that it looks like what you're doing. So here is your implied prior on everything. And so the question is, is what is the solution to this? So here's where we're going to go with this. Next time I'm going to come in, I'm going to work through this with you. We're going to go through this solution so that you actually know what the base factor is. But then we're going to remember the correspondence between the posterior probability and the base factor. So the posterior probability, so pi beta j is equal to 0, given x's and y's. This is going to be this. One plus one minus pi naught over pi naught. Whatever this base factor is, we just compute it, invert it, invert it. So this is just basis theorem in disguise, what we went through before. So maybe you guys have on your video. So, so what you're going to be doing is you're basically going to be flipping this coin all the time to decide if that beta j is in the model or not in the model. You're just going to set up a Gibbs sampler essentially 
to roll through these full conditional probabilities. You're going to be scanning over different J's and considering whether or not they're zero. You're going to do that over and over and over again in a kip sampling fashion until things converge. So things settle down to these ones are zeros. And the way you're going to end up measuring the overall posterior probability of something being zero is its posterior frequency of being zero. So in your dip sampler after convergence, if you find out that on 10% of the iterations it's zero, that means that it has a posterior probability of 0.1 of being zero. You're going to be looking for things that have a high posterior probability of being zero. What you're going to get out of this is this joint association that Lasso and Rich don't do a really good job. So anyway, we'll come back next time. We'll write down this GIP sampler. We'll try to understand this integral, but I'm going to leave a little bit of work for you. And then I'm going to move on to more interesting things like mixture sampling and tell you about lots of interesting things that you'll see in your advanced base class. And I will test you on all of that. I'll give you lots of time to work on this. Thanks, you guys. That's it for now.